And here we are. Are you ready to talk about dark, dark world building? Well, I have for you the most spectacular guest. I would like to welcome to the stage, Michael Williams. Michael, how are you doing today? Oh, just a note, Michael, you are muted. Just click that mute button. Oh, yeah, there you go. We should hear you now. Go ahead. Michael, are you I've okay? I've lost sound here. Can you hear me? Oh, Michael, we hear you. Yes. Well, you know what we say, folks, it's not a World Anvil stream without some Audio oh, we're issues. all right. We're all right. I, there we go. <laughs> like an idiot, I have my damn earphones off. Oh, well, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> well, we see each other. We hear each other. Michael, Michael, welcome to the first ever virtual world building con stage to talk about dark, dark world building. How are you doing today? Well, af after this auspicious start, uh, <laughs> Uh, I'm. Uh, I understand the last guest was recovering from a cold. I'm about a, a, a day or two post COVID, so I've oh, asked yeah. everybody here to uh, to please uh, forgive a certain sluggishness. But I'm ready and raring to go. Well, I'm so glad, and I do hope you're feeling better soon. We are so thrilled to have you here. Let me introduce Michael properly. Author of 15 novels, a number of stories and poems, and the late lamented mythical realism travel blog, Michael Williams has been writing and publishing over the last 30 years. His most recent work, The City Quartet, four magical realist novels, uh, set in a city that is not Louis... Now, let me get this right. Louisville, Kentucky. Am I saying that right? Uh this is a subject of continuous controversy. Uh, oh, Louisville uh, is the way that I say it. I've heard Louisville, just never Louisville. Okay, okay. I will I will not make that egregious <laughs> error. <laughs> These books have received widespread critical acclaim. A native of Louisville, he has lived in a number of far-flung spots, but now dwells in sleepy and domestic southern Indiana, recently retired from a professorship at the University of Louisville. He is currently drinking bourbon, that sounds amazing, and at work on a long narrative poem that ties to the novels in the City Quartet, because what is a quartet without a fifth? So it's becoming a quintet, is that correct? And it's also containing a fifth for the bourbon. Glorious. Glorious. I am here for all of this. And of course, you uh, you worked with our first guest here today as well, with Tracy Hickman. Oh yeah, you? Tracy. Tracy and I actually shared an office when, uh, uh, when the project uh, when when Dragonlance was just formulating, and it was a it was a grievously damaged office in the third floor of an old building in Lake Geneva, and Tracy would have to brace his uh, foot against the floor to keep from sliding all the way across it. So uh, that had auspicious beginnings too. That had a dark start, but it turned out all right, didn't it? Well, that brings us nicely onto our talk today. From Game of Thrones to Warhammer 40k to Battlestar Galactica, tune, tone, mood and aesthetic are elements that can be used to differentiate your world. And today we're going to be talking about bringing a darker edge to your world building efforts. So let's kick off with a question that I think is very important. If you're interested in building dark worlds, does genre affect your world building? Are some genres naturally darker than others, would you say? Uh, yes, but uh, I don't think you need to uh, need to be restrained or inhibited if, uh, if you're doing, say, a Western and you want it to be extraordinarily dark and gothic. Uh, the blending of genres and the blending of uh, tropes and conventions can very, very often get you to some interesting places uh, if you're writing in a genre that is not otherwise regarded as altogether dark. Um, I'm thinking of probably one of my favorite little novels when you when you brought this up. It's a book by Carlos Fuentes, a Mexican uh, novelist. It's called Aura. Yeah. And it is a combination mystery, ghost story, historical romance, possibly, but not certainly, a vampire novel uh, in which a historian enters a building, uh, basically getting a job as a tutor uh, and uh, as rewriting the manuscripts of an old woman's husband who's recently died. 
and finds himself plunged into, can it be, uh, you know, a, a gothic realm, a ghostly realm? Is it in another century? Uh, so those, those kinds of blending of generic pressures and generic impulses can create some really uh, wonderful uh, uh, combinations of things, really challenging combinations of things. That's fascinating. Um, are there specific genres that you think don't work for a dark world? Mm. Like things that you, you would never want to do something dark with? Uh, I actually, when Kat asked me to do this panel, I was a little surprised. I'm not really known as a dark artist, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't put any genre out of my reach. I think, you know, why not try it? And, uh, and why not, exp uh, human beings have a, uh, have a dark aspect to us. And, uh, we carry that with us, whether we're, uh, whether we're cowboys or romance heroines or, uh, uh, dwarves. Okay. Uh, and so, uh, I think it can manifest itself in uh, any kind of narrative. Uh, if you think about characterization as part of what impels the darkness. Does that help? Yes, absolutely. That actually leads me wonderfully to my next question. What do you think it is that lures us to dark worlds? Why are we, as authors and as readers and, and as gamers, why are we so fascinated with them? Mm. Uh, part of it, uh, and I guess it's kind of a standard thing, is, is a vicarious uh, a vicarious thrill. Uh, the uh, late 19th century used to talk about the frisson of horror, that little shiver that you get, and they love that kind of thing. And you know, uh, I'll I'll go watch a, a movie where some goofy person starts going up the stairs in a building. I know I would never go there, never do that. And yet, I want to see what happens to them. And I'm glad it's going to be them, other than me. So you think that there's a sort of part of the fun is that dramatic irony in a way as well. Like you can see what's going to happen to somebody else, but it's not happening to you. So then it's it's more alluring. Yeah. And I think I think we all struggle against our own darknesses. And uh, I mean, if we're trying to live an authentic life, we do. And uh, then we. Uh, we. We see in the examples of other people confronting and perhaps, if not uh, if not conquering, at least maintaining with the darkness, we seek something that in ourselves that we could use. Uh, it becomes, in a way, psychologically or spiritually useful. Yeah. Uh, KF02 says, it's a chance for us to explore the darker aspect of ourselves in a safe fashion. Yeah, I think she's right. Yeah. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, you can see that by the by the by the continuous popularity of our we'd rather we'd rather look at what happens to people in the theater than what's going to happen to them when we walk outside the door. Yeah, there's an immediacy to that. There's a brutality to that, that uh, that the narrative act distances and perhaps controls because it's distancing it. So we can uh, we can allow to see our uh, to see that in ourselves without being what disrupted without being uh implicated by it maybe yeah absolutely and that creates a really interesting dichotomy because on the one hand we're trying to create these sort of as you said this frisson of experience this yeah. sort of thing that is very far <coughs> outside our own experience in what ways can we then create reader experiences in dark fiction and, and in games that still vibrate like that still feel familiar enough to be uh, emotionally impactful for the mm. average reader or player. That's that's an excellent question, and I've been I've been asked something along that line before. And take a look at Sigmund Freud's essay on the uncanny, uh, where he talks about the returning to something uh, that you have seen before in perhaps a traumatic context and it becomes defamiliarized. When the familiar stuff around us becomes suddenly unfamiliar for whatever reason, whether it's an outside agency, uh, 
in, in the book I was talking about, uh, uh, Felipe Montoya, uh, wonders if there are vampires coming at him or whether it's, or whether he's going nuts. It's, it could be one or the other. Uh, in, those, uh, in those situations, the familiar becomes unfamiliar. And I think that's at the heart of just a heck of a lot of darkness in fiction. Yeah, so it's almost that kaleidoscopic thing where, well, actually that sort of house of mirrors where the familiar becomes unfamiliar and the unfamiliar becomes familiar in many ways. Yeah, yeah. Uh, my, uh, my books, uh, my city quartet books uh, deal with, as, a, as you were saying, the, the city of Louisville, uh, that uh, is, uh, is the city that I grew up with uh, in and revisit and know, but it is laced through with darkness, mythological and horrific and gothic implications. So a lot of the darkness in these books comes at the corner of your eyes rather than confronting them initially uh, head on. Uh, and to me, that can be almost darker than a, a straight on confrontation with the darkness. Uh, Stephen King always said the hardest thing about uh, having a monster in a book was the revealing of it because people yeah. would say, oh, is that all it is? And uh, uh, and if you keep things hanging at the corner of the vision, sometimes it achieves the effects that you want to achieve with the darkness. But I'd have to ask, why do people want to include darkness in the narrative beyond just getting this little frisson, getting uh, appealing to uh, appealing to readers, uh, appealing to uh, viewers? Uh, I think it has to have a narrative purpose. Yeah. I think it has to be uh, uh, implicit in the plot. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Really interesting. That actually, again, so smoothly brings me on to my next question, which is what elements in world building and in plot and in storytelling can we use to establish a dark tone or mood or aesthetic for our world? Okay. Uh, Let's name them again. You want the elements in uh, world building? What was again? World building or plot to okay. help us establish this sure. dark character in our okay. in our storytelling space. All right. Uh, I would say, and, and sorry for that uh, blip there. It, it, okay. It's really don't get COVID if you haven't had it. Uh, there story. are. <laughs> uh, Plot is, it's always uncertainty. Mm, uncertainty yeah. is a, a, a big thing when the character, when the narrator, when your protagonist <clears throat> steps across from the familiar into the unfamiliar or at the threshold between the two, uh, that's a place where it is created. I also think, and this is a personal uh, preference, it might not be something that, uh, uh, that the... Uh, uh, that the people who are here are are that enthusiastic about, but place is a character mm -hmm. yes. that you interact with place in the same ways that you would uh, the uh, your protagonist interacts with uh, with a place in the same way he does with his brother or yeah. his uh, his girlfriend or whatever. Uh, that uh, when you think about discovering the place gradually, you discover its first impressions, uh, and then its subliminal and even liminal uh, impressions that can sometimes be dark. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Do you have any tips while we're on plot for uh, creating that uncertainty with a plot? How, do, how can we create the space that feels uncertain, that, that gives our readers this uncertainty? Can I, can I approach that through characterization? Yeah, bring it. I'm uh, here for it. My buddy Margaret Weiss, uh, who's also your uh, your top speaker's buddy, of course, uh, always used to say, "Even the dragon has a motive." Mm. And uh, if you have one of those dark, speculative tales in which you have a bona fide villain, rather than a character who contains both angel and devil within him. Uh, then that villain better damn well have a motive and it should be plausible. Yes. You should be able to uh, say he wants to kill that guy and it makes sense. Yeah. 
Uh, and when you have that kind of thing, what it does is it sets you back on your heels and it makes you perhaps uncertain about your own most ready assumptions. You're not going to go out, close the book, or leave the theater and say, yeah, let's go kill people. But it's going to, in a way, make you uncertain that uh, that a quick and ready assumption is always the way to deal with uh, some of the great issues. Yeah, really interesting. So motivation is a gateway for that is, is yeah, a fascinating yeah, idea. Yeah. You also mentioned creating location as a character. Now, that's mm -hmm. something that so many people talk about and some writers have done so, so well. Do you have any tips for doing that? Because a lot of us, when we think of locations, we think of, okay, there are walls and there are, you know, like there are chairs in the room. But it's hard for, for many writers, especially young writers, to take that next step and, and create a, a place as a character. Yeah, uh, I would suggest that... Uh... Uh, what I, an exercise that I've seen against students, a uh, stand in a room, yeah, uh, and before uh, and just take in the room with a, with a, an initial impression. How does it make you feel? Mm -hmm. What in the room made you feel that? Then go back and sort of trace your uh, trace your thoughts through the room, trace your observations through the room. What were the kinds of things that drew that initial response? Now, when you write about the room, you those are the things that you choose to create mood, to create uh, uh, to create atmosphere. Uh, another exercise might be uh, to go to that same room, that same description, rewrite it as a wounded war veteran who's just returned home. Rewrite it as a woman who has lost her husband. Uh, uh, rewrite it as a uh, as a child who has been forbidden to go into the room. Uh, all of these kinds of things estrange the particular detail in one way or another, and it's really useful. Again, it's character based, and the, and it's also again the relationship of a character to the room as a character. Uh, so that's what I mean, basically, about place being a character. And it's at least how I use it. I agree. Lots of people use it, but I use it particularly that way. Fantastic. Thank you so much for explaining that. You've talked a lot about character and character led writing and character led description. Of course, as writers, this, this is so, so critical. Can you tell me a little bit more about creating characters for dark settings? Yeah. Let me, let me put my thoughts together for a second. Absolutely. Uh, the darkness needs to rise out of a great wound. Mm -hmm. You need to know the wound. You need to know what the character's wound is. It doesn't necessarily have to mean that you have a scene, you know, uh, again, uh, Freud, where we go back, trace back to the root of the trauma. You don't need to have the scene. You need to know what it is. Because if you know what it is, and you know specifically what it is, it filters its way and shapes and shades the actions of that dark character. Uh, Raceland is a is a wonderful example of this, uh, and uh, and then there are you, you mentioned Game of Thrones examples of this, and we're just uh, finding out in that uh, what is it that uh, uh, House of Dragons. Uh, some of the kind of cultural trauma that might have risen to uh, to happen in the narrative present of Game of Thrones. So, so yeah, what you do is uh, is you start with that trauma, and then you let it paint and shade uh, the actions of the character. You give the character a motive consistent with that trauma, yeah, uh, and uh, something that he or she wants more than anything and uh, doesn't have to be evil. You know, it's not like uh, I will destroy the world as you know it, or it's, or even more stupidly, it's not like uh, I am here solely to oppose your sympathetic protagonist. Yes. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, the character should have a particular, uh, uh, a particular focus in mind and uh, should be working toward it uh, to the point that 
what becomes interesting in the plot is when he come uh, when he comes cross purposes with the uh, with the desires and the motives of the more uh, a sympathetic character. Fantastic. So uh, that that keeps you away from uh, that keeps you away sometimes from the whole naughty question of good and evil because I I don't think that works all the time in, a, in good fiction. Yeah, absolutely. I think one of the hallmarks of dark worlds is that good and evil are very muddled gray at best and very hard to indistinguish. Yeah, yeah, I agree. <laughs> when you look at worlds like Battlestar Galactica, worlds like uh, the world of the Witcher, it's very much everybody is doing their best or they're mm. definitely not doing their best. And that's pretty much the difference between good and evil. Mm. And that's, that's that's drawn right out of the uh, uh, right out of the tradition of the novel where uh, uh, in centuries, the, the more realist novel would yeah. uh, would paint a character in all of uh, his or her complexity, uh, so that we could see all sides of them. I think that uh, I think that when Tolkien is writing, for example, the Lord of the Rings, where the good guys and the bad guys are pretty clearly drawn, Tolkien is coming out of a tradition of medieval romance. Yes, absolutely. Uh, and uh, and then what he's doing, and what's the brilliant. Thing that he did as a writer is he anchors that whole idea on the whole big sprawling 19th century novel. So we begin to see these ro uh, characters of romance talk like realistic people. And of course, the next step is to make the, uh, the ambiguities that we see in the 19th century novel come to play in the 20th century and 21st century fantasy. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So we've talked a lot about character and I think when we talk about character, it's really important to talk about character agency. Now, some worlds are so dark that it's hard for a character to have a, a lasting effect. Do you feel like the dark nature of a world does affect the level of the character agency or should affect the level of the character agency? I personally can't operate in a world, uh, a fictional or actual, where uh, a character has no agency. Yeah. Uh, so it's a hard question. I would leave that to people who are more interested in that area philosophically, because that's an area that I don't tread. Uh, I, uh, I believe that cr uh, fiction creates meanings. And I believe that my experience uh, as a human being should create meanings uh, regardless of uh, the apparent meaninglessness of the world around me. I've got to create them. I've got to make them up, if nothing else. So you feel like without a certain amount of character agency, this, it, it's very inhibiting to actually tell stories? Yeah, I do. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. They're not stories I'm going to be interested in. Now, I'm not saying somebody else might. Somebody else might find them fascinating, but no. Yeah, fair. that would strike me as being uh, pre pretty much totally atmosphere and posture. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, when we talk about dark worlds now, there is a scale of darkness. We've talked about some dark worlds. I would say Battlestar Galactic is fairly down there. We've mm -hmm. got, you know, Warhammer 40K. I don't know if you're familiar. One of the nope. darkest worlds out there. Um, <laughs> basically, it's chaos and, and horrible things. And that's the two sides. Uh, <laughs> So how dark is too dark? And how can you balance a dark, gritty setting with lighter elements without destroying your mood altogether? Wow. You gotta you gotta find yourself you gotta find yourself a smart thirteen year old reader. Okay. Because if they start saying, ew, that's too much, that's too much, uh, uh, then you know, <laughs> you know you kind of crossed the line. But uh, it's not a question that I think I deal with that much mm -hmm. because there's an instinct in me that pulls back from it. I guess that instinct would be something that I would look at and say, would I want to uh, uh, those around me to read this? Uh, the the people that I really care about to read this uh, and uh, to gather from it something about a view of the world uh, that I was supposedly presenting and 
maybe be influenced by that. I don't know. I don't, uh, I, I find myself able to draw the line pretty readily. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely reasonable. I think for me, one of the things that is, um, is very present in a lot of the dark worlds that I've experienced, uh, which, which counterbalances that is, is a sense of hope or a sense of trending upwards, yep. not everywhere, but in some little pockets of the world, you might encounter it. Yes. And I think that that's uh, what makes for either the power or the poignancy of yeah. the work. Uh, it becomes that much more, what, uh, uh, that much more tragic when that, those little lights, uh, W.H. Auden says, when Hitler's invading Poland, might I light one affirmative candle? And yeah. when that candle goes out, uh, uh, that world is plunged into a darkness that I don't want to inhabit as a reader. Yeah. I mean, I'll, if it ever happens out here, I'll have no choice. But I can close the book or leave the theater. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that what you say there is very, is, is just so pertinent to the discussion. It's that moment of, you know, is this too dark for me? Is this something where my my ideal readers, whoever they are, your alpha readers, your beta readers, the people that you love that know, read your stories, is this something that they would close the book and say, no, thank you? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I think for beginner world builders in the chat or people who are are finding it hard to share their work, I think that's a really important lesson as well, is that you, you, know, you have to be thinking about your readers, but also you, you have to share your work with other people because otherwise, otherwise you can't know these things. Right. So um, what would you say are some common mistakes in building dark worlds? You said yourself, you know, Game of Thrones, all of these spaces, uh, that there are very dark worlds out there. I'm not asking you to name names particularly, although you are welcome to. Um, but what do you think are common mistakes people make when they are building these dark settings? I'll tell you one, and I've felt this for a long time. It's personal prejudice. Killing animals to show that the villain is bad. That sucks. Kicking puppies. Yeah. 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 Uh, I can remember from, from the beginning. I can read the Iliad and see the whole Trojan army get mowed down. It doesn't do a thing to me. But when that dog dies at the end of uh, the Odyssey after waiting for Odysseus for 20 years, I'm starting to tear up now as I'm talking about that. Uh, there's something about that kind of ready violation of innocence that people... Uh, people find outraged in a way that doesn't necessarily mean I'm outraged. I want to go on. It's, I'm outraged. I don't want to read this. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what else? Uh, when it seems when the darkness and the uh, sort of Gothic furniture uh, seem to be irrelevant to the plot and character everything you put in the story should reverberate with everything else in the story if not <clears throat> it doesn't belong there and it uh and with something like horror or with something like sex uh the accumulation of those elements in a story which are not anchored in character and not anchored in the story tend to be cloying they tend to be boring yeah. it's like a too close up porno shot or something Oh, um, I'm so sorry. I just completely lost my train of thought. I'm back. <laughs> sorry, a tiny little sorry. blue screen of death in my brain. Um, so uh, what I'm hearing is that a lot of people jump too readily to the dark stuff without building a gradation um, to it. And sometimes mm. you just go too far, in your opinion. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, what would you oh, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. I was going to say, what would you say then are some of your favorite examples of really good dark world building? Mm. I actually do like Tolkien's dark, yeah. the dark areas of Middle Earth. Uh, and largely because he does this in ways that make them cohabit with the light areas that they're they're all there simultaneous um i like 
those passages in uh, Le Guin's Earthsea trilogy, especially mm-hmm. in Tehanu and the farthest shore, where <clears throat> we are reaching the end of expectation and imagination. <clears throat> and the result is that the that all the familiar and all the comfortable in the world is beginning to strip away. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Those are very, very beautiful examples of that. Um, you mentioned before, you know, these these sensitive subjects, kill it, killing animals was one of them, in that are very characteristic of dark world building. Um, do you have any recommendations for handling these kinds of subjects? Because yes. sometimes they do come up in plots. Sure, they do. Absolutely. Uh, I was just thinking, uh, you know, if you're doing something about the ancient world, uh, animal sacrifice is going to be involved or something like that. Can you turn away? Yeah. Can you uh, can you lead the bull to the uh, what's it? What was it called? Torobolum, where they uh, where the bull, uh, blood spilled down upon the uh, uh, upon the Mithraic initiatives. Can you lead the bull to that uh, pit and then switch to another scene? Yeah. Uh, two things that does. Uh, first of all, it uh, it's less indulgent. And Mm. second of all, it puts in the lap of your reader imagining that scene. And they're going to do it in a way that is far more horrific to them than you could paint it in words or film. Yeah, this tracks back to what you were saying before about Stephen King not wanting to reveal the monster because it's more horrific. He's absolutely right on that. Yeah. Yeah. So what I'm hearing is let your reader's imaginations do the work really always and uh and people seem to think that in dark fiction and horrific fiction uh that uh sometimes overstatement is the preferred way to go and i really think that understatement uh sometimes accomplishes even more less is more in that particular vein of narrative yeah absolutely do you have any tips on that on helping readers to fill in those blanks you don't want to fill in, like just Mm. before you fade to black, for example? Uh, Write them yourself, write them out, have them Mm. there. uh, Everybody remember to revise, you know, Uh, and uh, and then move back and cut away what is absolutely necessary for the reader to understand what has taken place uh, without much of anything else maybe a little but much of anything else and then the reader's imagination will take over uh for bump the event if it's the if it's the bull sacrifice that we're talking about for bump them leading the bull to the uh uh, to the place so that you are led along with the uh, characters to the event then you leave the stuff out nice okay i have a Maybe it's a silly question. Maybe it's not. It's a matter of great contention. And I feel like Uh it comes up more often in dark fiction than in other kinds of fiction. So, to swear or not to swear? I swear like a sailor. (laughs) Um, Like a bad sailor. Like an Irish sailor. Uh, (laughs) Yeah. uh, I see nothing wrong. Uh, Once again, we go to character and plot. I see nothing wrong. Uh, uh, the uh, the Irish sailor is going to swear more than Boston Aunt Trudy. Yes. Okay. Uh, so uh, whatever you have with that should be c- consistent with the character. Sometimes it's uh, it comes across as a little bit excessive, but uh, if you own that in the character itself, it's not it's no problem for me as a reader fair do you feel like it's something that adds to that sort of darkness or grittiness of a world that it makes things feel yeah. grittier yeah uh look at scorsese movies yeah uh, uh and uh, uh an example of a dark world that's not a speculative world but uh but in a way it is it's a fantasized gangster world for example uh and if you look at scorsese movies with the uh the language becomes a cadence it becomes a music uh it becomes part of the soundtrack of the uh of the darkness uh so yeah i think that uh uh, that's part of a big point about uh about creating dark fiction too in that language does it 
whether through understatement, whether through a particular adept kind of embellishment or uh, through the dialogue of the characters. Okay, then I have a follow-up question for you for speculative worlds. World-specific swearing or real-world swear words? Can made-up swear words feel weaker or do you feel like they, they can still be as impactful or are they a, a cheap way up? I always think that they sound lame. <laughs> yeah, fine. I can't, I, I can't think of an example. Uh, Margaret did some really good name calling in Dragonlance, but not swear. She didn't do the swearing, but yeah. uh, uh, but I I don't see too much fantasy world swearing that I that works to my ear. Now other people might say, "Oh, I like this. You know, this is great." I might have not have read what other people have read, but uh, no, I I I wouldn't do it in a speculative book. Fair. I mean, um, they would say the same, uh, the say the same things that Scorsese's gangsters would say. Yeah, absolutely, fair enough. You feel like that conveys more meaning to a real world yeah, audience. Yeah, and our, our audience is real world. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, I have some fantastic audience questions here that sure. have been coming in for the whole forty minutes that we've been talking. Um, we're going to kick off with a. I don't want to call it spicy because this is something, this is like a real world experience for a lot of people, but it's a question from Surayan who asks, um, regarding darkness in writing, what are your thoughts on writing using personal experience of self-harm and mental illness? Certainly this needs to be done with dignity, but also readers may not be willing to engage. So I think the other question here is trigger warnings, yes, no, how? And um, also what are your thoughts on this? No on trigger warnings. Uh, I I would say that any kind of uh, reticence or any kind of restraint, I would say to the writer of this, uh, should be in your camp. Uh, should be as you uh, as you choose to present. Uh, you're saying it's personal experiences, uh, so it's probably the writer's experience. Uh, so I would say, what are you willing to reveal? Uh, press it just a little further and that's it. Yeah. yeah, absolutely fair. Very wise. We have a question here from Emily Armstrong who asks, how do you think technology and modern society have impacted the way we approach dark world building and the new challenges and opportunities it presents for writers? Uh, she adds, even looking at dark fantasy and horror from the last 30 years, the way tech infects our lives is so very different. I agree. I, that's a that's a heck of a good question, Emily. Uh, I'll probably leave the uh, answer of uh, of tech and uh, how tech is going to affect the dark world to your generation, because mine is nearly past. But uh, one of the things that I've seen happen uh, with this is uh, that every time there are a significant wave of technological advances. Uh, the artistic community uh, adapts to them very often by using some of the old uh, tropes and genres uh, so that something like uh, Metropolis comes along uh, and couples uh, this whole rescue paradise lost uh, scenario with machinery. With mm -hmm. the fact that the uh, that the 1920s German community is afraid that they are going to become machine men, okay. Yeah. So I think that uh, what begins to happen is that you carry your forms of storytelling with you, and you begin to shift them onto the new material that you're looking at, and then when you do that, they blend, they mix together. And they make for other narratives. I hope that makes mm -hmm. sense. I know what I mean. <laughs> yeah, I think I think that's fascinating. And as you say, the whole way that it, it can shift a paradigm and the whole way that it can it can really feed into the zeitgeist, I think is yeah, yeah absolutely it's fascinating. A wonderful question here from Istaros, I'm gonna guess. How can we manage to balance between good, evil, and gray natures of characters to raise contrast obviously something core in the in the dark world building space as we discussed before yeah uh i 
Think of yourself. Think of people you really know. They have all of these elements. How do they balance or not balance them? Uh, because uh, because sometimes uh, it's not as much a balance as a tension yeah. or a struggle. So how you manage those in your character, in your characters, in your fiction, might imitate the way that you, uh, a very realistic way of the way that you see people balance them or create tensions with them or struggle with them in life. Yeah, I think that's very wise. I know a lot of authors have told me none of the characters I write are me, but almost all of them have something of me in them. Yeah. My first book, Weasel's Luck, had uh, had three brothers in it. <clears throat> and one of my friends asked me, which of the brothers were you? And I said, all of them. Yeah. Uh, and it is, it's just... It's just the way that you do. You invest uh, what each character needs uh, of yourself. Yeah, absolutely. And um, we're all terribly complicated as people. We like to pretend yeah. that we're not, but we're all terribly complicated. We have all sorts of weird, stray thoughts and odd impulses. Uh, we, we can never represent that in a single character. So no. I think we have to tease out all of these little bits and pieces and put them in different characters anyway. I think that, that brings life and realism to our stories. That's why the Greeks had 12 gods. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Secretly one personality. Yeah. <laughs> do you have, speaking of which, do you have any strategies for injecting humor into dark stories? Asks Hugh Pierre. Whoa. Uh, uh, okay, Hugh, it rises from the situation, okay? Uh, and... Uh, you're probably going to find that the humor that rises from the situations is sort of like uh, not necessarily uh, uh, warm-hearted chuckles. Uh, but uh, mine usually uh, arises from character response. Mm. Uh from uh, the uh, uh, the hope that uh, of one character to have another to accompany him and says, yeah, here it is. This is where it happened. This is where, uh, you know, I saw the, uh, the huge lizard under the theater and he looks down there and he looks to the friend who has vanished. Uh, and it's funny, uh, but at the same time, uh, since it's in a dark story, uh, there should be a kind of broken and uh, uh, unnerving element to it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think that um, the way a character reacts to a situation can also be a source of humor. Yeah. Even when something isn't really funny. Yeah. You know, a reaction can can bring that to to a space. You know. Yeah. I think it's also a question of is it humor for the character or humor for the audience because. They're two yeah. very different things, right? Yeah, well, and ultimately, the, the, the humor that uh, impels the book is the one for the audience. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So then you get into the space of things like dramatic irony and how you yeah. can use that. Like, is it funny for the, the audience, but not for the characters? Or are the audience laughing with the characters? Mm -hmm. yeah. Usually the audience is more comfortable with the uh, with dramatic irony. I think what, uh, what happens is can be kind of interesting is when dramatic irony is splintered and all of a sudden your tendency or your, your hope that you can sit back on high and laugh at a character uh, is fractured and you begin to realize that you're being called into account too. It's like those moments in a Shakespeare play uh, where there's a play within a play and all the actors are sitting there commenting on the play and uh, uh, they don't realize that uh, uh, the players don't realize that the actors are commenting on them. Uh, and you imagine that Shakespeare's audience uh, is commenting on the actors, commenting on the players. And it ends up that you end up looking over your shoulder to see if somebody's watching you. Sort of Greek chorus to the power yep, X exactly. somehow. Exactly. Well, Great Chorus Inception, I think that might be where we have to stop for today. Do you have a final piece of advice for dark world building for our audience? Yes. Uh, do your best not to let the dark outweigh the light. Uh, pure and simple. 
uh, I think the task of the artist is to strive for uh, strive for a mind of, uh, and, a, and a soul at peace with itself, and uh, that may involve tearing up a lot of stuff. But uh, if the ultimate uh, if the ultimate path, the ultimate goal is that uh, peace, is that serenity, uh, uh, prefer the light to the dark. Fantastic. Well, Michael, this has been an absolutely wonderful conversation. Thank you so very much. Thank you. What Thanks, are you working Mike. on right now? Can I ask? <coughs> oh, <God. laughs> Uh, getting better, I working hope. Working <laughs> on getting better. Uh, well, the, the city quartet that I talked about, uh, I am writing uh, a narrative poem that goes mm -hmm. with the city quartet because, as I said in the introductory material I sent you, uh, uh, what's a fourth, uh, what's a quartet without a fifth? And that's what I'm working on right now. Uh, the, uh, uh, the quartet's available on Amazon and uh, a couple of my older and pretty good books uh arcady and alamanda you can still find in remainder shelves everywhere and uh of course people who know me from here know me probably from my dragon Lance work i am so grateful you came in to talk to us today michael thank you so very much the chat is saying get better happy recovery um, and I do hope you feel better soon. Thank you so thanks much. Thanks for the uh, thanks for the perceptive questions. Thanks for the brilliant interview. I enjoyed it. Oh, this has been a blast for me too. I'm so glad to hear that. Well, folks, grab a drink and uh, come right back. In ten minutes, we are live with Magic Systems in World Building, and who could that possibly be with? Creator of Eberron and so much more, Keith Baker, senior game designer over at Cobalt Press, Celeste Conowich, and president of Pinnacle Entertainment and Triple A game designer Shane Hensley. They're all going to be here talking about Magic Systems, so you better be here too, folks. Until then, you know what we always say: grab your hammer and go World Build.